Hello and welcome again to another episode of Behold the Lamb Presents. I'm Chris Shelton, your host, and I look forward to spending this hour with you. Today's message has somewhat of a long title. Pope Leo XIII, we hold upon the earth the place of God Almighty. The last portion of today's title may surprise some of you, but I'm sure that many of you realize that this is a quote from Pope Leo XIII from his encyclical letter of June 20th, back in 1894. And should you be curious enough to research this statement or this title, you will find that Pope Leo XIII was and or is not the only one that has this very same thought. So, is it any wonder that this self-exaltation to that of God on earth has brought about major laws and traditions that affect all of us in one form or another? And what other church leader that you know of gets the same homage as is shown to the Pope? I don't know of any myself. With such world dominance for so many years, it should not surprise anyone that this religio-political power is described in the Word of God. God, the true God of heaven, whom in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6 states that, I am the first I, and I am the last and besides me there is no God. He saw fit to warn us about this power in His Word. So today, Pastor Kenny Shelton will be delving specifically into the prophecies of Daniel 7 to share with each of us what the Holy Spirit of God has laid upon his heart about this power that claims to be God Almighty on earth and how this power will continue to affect God's people until they are all sealed. Again, the title of the message today is Pope Leo XIII, we hold upon the earth the place of God Almighty. But first, let's visit 3ABN and listen to a song entitled Rock of Ages as sung by Pam Lister.
Praise the Lord. Welcome to Behold the Lamb Ministries. We're very grateful and thankful that you've decided to join us today. And to me, one of the most exciting subjects because it points to the last days. There are very, very many, many, many people in the world who say, oh, why would you choose something like this? Why? Because the Bible has spoken it first. The Bible has warned God's last day people. That can be anybody that wants to be a part of his family, the church. You know, I don't look at it, oh, this is Adventist message, this is Baptist message, this is Church of God message. It's the message of the Bible of Jesus Christ. We have every right, every right to go to God's Word and read what He says there. And I feel, like I say sorry, I feel sorry for those who have been told by their pastors and their teachers to stay out of the book of Daniel and Revelation. Now, you may have been part of that, not trying to hurt you in any form or fashion. Things that I will speak today is not just trying to point you out or try to point somebody is just all wrong, but point out what God has pointed in His Word. And it's going to be distasteful by the majority of the world because the Bible says so. I'm not happy about that, but I didn't write the Word, right? God only tells us to give the Word as He's given it to us truthfully and we want to do that today again our our subject title my wife mentioned before in the beginning which you did not see here but what will go on the air and around the world she mentioned the pope leo the 13th most people know that and they go back in history he simply made this statement we hold upon the earth the place of god almighty that is just a big statement that most of us read and we let it go off our back like water off of the duck's back. Are we there? Really, we read that. How many of us have really read that and really thought anything about it other than, well, they said. No, I'm taking issue with it today based on God's Word. And naturally, how can we do it? I can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, usually all I do is mess things up. But I know the Holy Spirit can straighten out the messes that, that the Lord has impressed my heart and mind to bring forward today. I'm going to pray about it. I pray that you will... Pray along with me just as I kneel here. Merciful God in heaven, truly we want to commit ourselves into thy care and thy keeping. I ask forgiveness of any sin, anything in my heart and life that needs not be there. Lord, we need the power of thy Holy Spirit. We need you to come into our hearts and our lives and the minds and not look at something as personal or like a hate crime or we're, we're against this group or that. We are against error. We are against the enemy of error, and that needs to be exposed. And we pray the word of God, you already have exposed it. And we pray that it will be brought home by your power and your strength and your might. Lord, grace us with your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. You notice we read, again, the, the subject title, it's pretty heavy duty, Pope Leo the Thirteenth. We hold, that's interesting, we hold upon the earth the place of God Almighty. I, I have, and I hope it's okay with you, I have an issue with that. I pray that you have an issue with that. Now again, it's, we've, not, we've got to look beyond family. We've got to look beyond our friends. It may be our companion, you see that holds certain things up, then we look in the Word of God and say, oh, I don't see it there. I don't see it there. And we must be willing to be able to talk about those things and see whether God says amen to it. If this is what God has said in His Word, or if it's something we need to back away from. Remember, for every truth that the Bible has, what is it? The enemy has what? Okay, we all know that. Okay, every truth, the devil has a, a, a counterfeit for it. Now remember, the devil is a counterfeit fitter. He doesn't want truth. He doesn't know truth. He's thrown truth out. He was thrown out of heaven. He came down to this earth to counteract everything that God put into operation. So don't think that your church, don't think that this church is an exception to the rule. That the devil can't come through the door. The only way I know he can get through that door is to come through me or you. And you know what? This morning, by the grace of God, I didn't open the door for him. Amen. I didn't open the door for him. Amen. So I pray that none of you have opened the door and allowing the enemy to come in. Because when he comes in, I'll tell you this, I found that he takes over. He takes over. He's not one just to sit back in the choir and be one of the boys. He's going to try to lead everybody astray. And you know, he usually starts with the leadership. 
That could be you, me, and whatever class or whatever you teach. I understand that well, and I ask for God's guidance and His direction in this, in this study. You know, if you turn to the book of Daniel, I just want to read a couple of quick verses here. Didn't know exactly how the Lord would, would lead and guide in opening of this. But I, I, I want it to come right straight from the Word of God. Why? Not that you haven't heard this before, but you know what? There will be millions that have not heard some of the things that we will mention here today. And the many who have heard it will say, it doesn't make any difference. Listen, everything that's said from this pulpit makes a difference because I'm going to read it from the Word of God or from the own lips of those, you see, who have made these statements. Remember, if it's against the Word of God, you and I have a right to stand up and say, that's not what God said. Then I think as mentioned here, maybe in our, even our children's story, then if I say something, and then you can come back later and say, well, I found out different. Well, go ahead. Let's discuss it. Let's bring it down. It's nothing wrong with it. Well, I disagree with you. Then tell me why you disagree. But when you do, you need to have some good information. Good information. Daniel chapter 7. We're going to be looking at something very, to me, it's fantastic because we study the books of Daniel and Revelation. Remember the book of Daniel was what? When it was given, it was closed, right, for a while until what? Until the time of the end. The book of Daniel was closed until what? The time of the end. We believe that we are in the time of the end. Friends, if we go through some of the studies, if we had time today, and we won't because I'll go on and on about certain things here that really gets under my skin. And we won't have time, but we have time other, you know, we can get together and maybe spend more time on it. God has just warned us over and over and over and in time frames and prophecies, you know, 2300 day prophecy and so on, that we are in the time of the end. He talks about a beast power. He talks about a power that would say certain things and that would claim certain things. And we look at it and say, well, yeah, well, they, maybe somebody's doing it. Maybe somebody is not. But notice in the book of Daniel chapter 7, just read verse 1, and then we will turn and try to discuss Daniel chapter 7. Remember, the book of Revelation has always been what? Can somebody say open book? It's been an open book because it reveals what? It reveals Jesus Christ, right, and things, verse 1, that are shortly to come to pass. That's why many times preachers say, stay out of the book of Revelation, don't study, but don't you want a revelation of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Revelation chapter, remember, Revelation chapter 1 says it's a revealing of Jesus Christ. The devil says, oh, no. I'm in trouble because it reveals Jesus Christ, and then it reveals my plan to hoodwink the world. And so somehow I'm going to try to keep them out of the book. Because there'll be some symbols, there'll be some things in there that's a little bit difficult to understand, and then I'll have some leaders to say, stay out of that book. Don't be studying it. And I ask you, why would God have pinned in the, His holy word things that we could not understand? Yes, and that reveals to His people what's getting ready to take place in the world. See, we should be known as a, a prophetic people. We should be able to know prophecy and say this and this and this is on the horizon. Why? Because God has said so. But see, the world has no idea which way it's going. And many of our leaders don't know which way they're going either. They need some help. But notice there in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, the Bible says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of what? Babylon, Daniel had a, come on with me, he had a what? He had a dream and the visions, so his dream was what? We say, well, it was just a dream. It was really a vision. Now what it said? A vision of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream, told the sum of the matter. So what happened? God gave Daniel a vision of something that was to take place. Notice this. Now, we'll read all those a little bit later on as we go, because it identifies this power that would come up that would claim to basically be God on earth, that would do things out of the ordinary, and the world doesn't seem to mind. We'll skip to verse 8. Notice, Daniel was concerned here. He said, I considered the what? What, do you, what does that really mean? I considered the what? The horn? I considered the horn, and behold, there came up among them a little horn. How many have heard, whether you can identify it or not, have heard as you read Bible prophecy about a little horn? Some of you have. If you haven't, it's all right. We're coming to the fact the Bible reveals there's going to come up a little horn. Remember, the book of Daniel and Revelation is in symbols. 
right? And what we have to do is dig for hidden treasure, find out what a horn, what this little horn is doing, why does it look like it's doing, and what is it doing, you know, in prophecy? And how does it deal with God's people? So Daniel says, oh, first of all, we consider Daniel was in vision, so we say what he was saying would be truth. Are we in agreement so far? All right, what Daniel was revealing is the truth. But he was even confused about it. He said, I considered, or I thought about this horn, and behold, there came up another little one. Notice, a little horn, before whom there were three horns plucked up. In case we don't have time to look at, we realize this was the breakdown of the Roman Empire when it broke down in Daniel chapter 2, where they had the, uh, you know, you had Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and iron Rome broke up into what? The ten toes, the ten names, which some of the nations are still, you know, ten over there now, still some of the names. So you can look at those, but here's the point. You notice that he said there came up another, didn't mean it's eleven. It said, up among there came up another little horn. And when he came up, he uprooted what? He uprooted three of the known kingdoms. If there were only ten nations in the world, surely history would have bared fact, bear fact to that. And it was true. But he said, when it come up, it just wasn't in addition to, but it would tear up, uproot three of the known ten. Interesting. Why? Because the three did not go along with the belief or the teachings of this power, this little horn power. They were plucked up by the roots. When something's plucked up by the roots, will it grow again? And behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of what? Man and a mouth speaking great things. We could spend a lot of time on that. We will not. Pope Leo wrote what? We hold upon this earth the place of what? God Almighty. Huh. What a strange statement. We hold the place of God Almighty. Now, some people will take that, and some of the people who want to defend this kind of stuff that is written will make all kind of excuses why it was written. And, and, and which, over and over, I can give you a lot of different quotes on this same purpose here. In fact, in Pope Pius V, Pope Pius V quoted in the Barclay, ch uh, chapter 27, page 218, says this. Listen carefully. He said, the Pope and God are the same. The Pope and God. See, that doesn't surprise most people. No one's going to get shocked out of your seat. I guess maybe I should have made little shockers underneath your seat. And if I think you should jump, I should push the button and then you will jump. You, yeah. You, you see what I'm saying here? That should make us jump. Because that's blasphemy in the worst scenario. There's no doubt about it. Now, we, we've just left it alone for so long. Not to criticize the present one. Not to you know, criticize all the past one. That's not it at all. But God speaks about this power, as we will identify. Notice, the Pope and God are the same. So he has all the power of heaven and earth. Well, let's just give you one more. There's plenty of them. Notice this. This comes, this comes from the Catholic National, July. And this is written in 1895. The Pope is not only, ooh, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of the flesh. Yeah, there you go. See, that's what I'm talking about. No, really, seriously, you think about who else in the world would say that about themselves? Notice that. He's not only the representative of Jesus Christ, he is Jesus Christ himself. Blasphemy again, there is no way. He's a sinner just like all the rest of us. If he's going to be saved, he'll be saved by grace, just like all the rest of us. My Bible says God is love, 1 John 4, 16. God is what? God is love. His nature is love. His law is love, right? He is love. He's always been Everything that he's ever said, ever done, ever had pinned down cannot change. And that cannot be altered in any form or fashion. He's the high. He's the holy. He's the one that is lifted up. He's the one that inhabits eternity is what my Bible tells me. He says he's from everlasting to everlasting. There is no God beside me. Time and time in Scripture, right, you read the Word of God, and all of a sudden somebody's saying they're God or they're part of something. God said, hmm, it's interesting. I don't know if there's any other. Listen, if God doesn't know if there's any other God, there is no other God. But yet we have 
a power on earth that says, I, I am. And I said, where, well, where would, this, where would this come? They said there is no variableness, right? He doesn't change. There's no variable. People say, well, God changed. Well, th- this is no longer. We today, we believe this and this and this because, well, God has changed. God has not changed. He has not changed one iota, right? He's, he's, he's consistent with the crossing of the T and the dotting of the I. God does not change. Why, how can you change truth? You just can't do it. This is, this is what excites me, really, and gives me encouragement in my Christian walk, is to know that God doesn't change. He still looks at me the very same way. He's not influenced by this group. He's not influenced by that group. He's not worrying about what the world is doing. He's not worrying about what you're thinking and what I'm thinking in that sense that he's going to hold just and justice and mercy to each and every one of us. I'm thankful for that. He's the high. He's the holy one. In him there is no shadow. Ooh, no shadow of turning is what the Bible said. Some of you want to jot down and say, well, where's that found? Well, good for you. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> Aren't you glad you? Somebody's asking it. Praise God. Isaiah 57, just jot it down. Isaiah 57, 15. Uh, Habakkuk 3, uh, verse 6. And uh, certainly James 1, 17. There is no shadow of turning. See, we can go to the Word of God. That's where we get it. Somebody else may say, well, now he's changed. You know, a preacher that gets up front and say God has changed, he ought to go out and get himself a real job. Amen. You know, he, I don't know where he could, I'm serious, I don't know where he can hold a job. The Bible is so clear when you read it that God does not what? He does not change. He will not change. He doesn't have to change. He knows the beginning and from the end, right? He knows everything in your life, every word that you'll say, every action, everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever done, God has it. Amen. Every decision he's made is the right decision. That's good. That gives me encouragement. But where did this business come from? Certainly didn't start with Pope Leo XIII. Many popes said it before, and people will say, well, you know, um, it didn't really, he didn't really mean that. Well, you know, Pope, when they talk, they say it's the voice of God. It's not to be changed. It's infallible. They claim infallibility. So we have to look at that point too, right? You can't go back and say, well, we didn't mean that. No, many, all of them said before, inf- infallible. So it's very interesting. Who, can I say who in the world? I guess I already did, Brother Terry. I guess I already, sometimes I just say it and then I ask if I can say it. So who, who would it be that would hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty? Where would it, where would it start? Can I just, get, just read a couple of verses, please, with, and see if you, see maybe if you agree. If you don't, it's good. I'll spend as much time with you after this as I need to because this is imperative. This is a life and death issue, and most people have no idea, and I don't understand why, but I need to see about this power and what this power is planned to do with God's people. Hmm. Ezekiel chapter 28, some of you know exactly where I'm going and what I'm going to read because it needs to be read. It needs to be read. Ezekiel chapter 28. Are we there? I'm getting hot and sweaty already. And usually once I get ready to go, I go for a long time. Terry might remember that from years ago, especially when I was young. The Bible says, don't you like that? The Bible says. No, and then you tell me who it's talking about here. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning with verse 13. It says, Thou hast been in Eden in the garden of God. That's a hint. Notice, this, this power was in Eden, right? Every precious stone was thy covering. Sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, and sardine. You know, it goes on. This sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold, workmanship. Now notice, talking about the pipes. Notice this. And in thee, in the day that thou was created. So it, it was a created being, right? Had all this stuff. Verse 14, and thou art the anointed cherub of the covenant. Notice this, cover. I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked in and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Notice, thou wast perfect. This created was perfect in the ways from the day when thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. So who, who was this? It was Satan. 
Notice, he was what? People want to know how sin get here. Well, it was the devil. He was perfect, the Bible said. Now, why do we want to argue with that? And many people do. He was perfect in the day that he was created. Isn't that what it says? Until iniquity or sin was found in him. Until he chose another way. You go a lot of different directions if you want to. He was perfect. huh? Until iniquity was found in him. Now, interesting, we see there the enemy, perfect. And then we see he made choice that was the wrong choice. And he started doing the wrong things and impressing other people to do the wrong things. And then we realize, I think it would behoove us if we read Isaiah 14, as many of you have read before. Or maybe you haven't read it. If you haven't, uh, maybe this will help to make sense. It's just talking about the devil. Are we there? Now remember, we're looking for this power that says, I'm God. This power that says, I'm ahead of everything. I'm, I'm God on earth. I can forgive sins. I can do all kinds of things. The Bible said in Isaiah 14, people may be very careful and study this like they may have never studied before because they try to say, well, that deals with Babylon. It deals with, just notice what it says, verse 12, Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven? Jesus said what? He was cast out. The old serpent, the devil, Satan, was cast out of where? Of heaven. Then he says, he tells the name. How wast thou cast out of heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which doth weaken the nations? Notice this. Here's what devil, here's what Satan said. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of congregations in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like what? Come on, church, wake up. I will be what? Satan said, I'm cast out, but I will be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. Well, he couldn't possibly show himself for what he really is, so therefore he makes choices. He chooses someone to represent him. Powers, nations... Even me and you at times when we do the work of the enemy. We have to be very careful. If we're not, he, the Bible said, he who is not with me is against me. The devil will use anything, everybody that he can to accomplish his purpose. But he said, I will be like the most high God. In other words, I'm going to hold up on the earth the place of God Almighty. Man, that's pretty heavy duty, wouldn't you say? Isn't that heavy duty? Is it maybe a little much, maybe too much for us today? So what is the purpose? Purpose, many purposes in this study. But to show from Scripture, now remember, there's good people everywhere in every denomination. I never apologize for presenting what is truth. You can never apologize. You don't want to hurt anybody. You're not trying to. But what you're doing is you're looking at, we're saying here, there's a power on the scene. And this power on the scene is saying here, they're going to fulfill what Satan has said when he came down to this earth. I'm going to take over. I'm going to take over. We're going to hold the place of God Almighty on this place. Man didn't say that within himself. The enemy's coming in. So the purpose really of this study is... Really to show from Scripture that what we believe is an unauthorized, uh, we can go so far as to say an unjust, it's groundless, it's absurd, a bold, attempted change. Now I'm going to go to this point here because people say, well, you, you folks are a little bit out of touch. You go on the seventh day Sabbath. Well, maybe somebody's out of touch. Is it just a matter of choice, or is it a matter of what God said in His Word? But I think this unjust, this groundless, this bold, attempted change of the seventh-day Sabbath was prophesied by Daniel the prophet. In Daniel 7.25, mark that down in Daniel 7.25. Notice Daniel 7.25. Notice, and he would speak great words against the Most High. Who is it? Who is the he? It would be Satan, would it not? The enemy would speak great words against the Most High. You realize this word here translated, when you look at it, great words in the Hebrew, is domineering words. He would speak great, huge words. He would speak stout words against what? Against the Most High. In other words, he would challenge God's position. 
He would try to take God's position, we say by hook or crook. And he couldn't do it by just coming out in the open. He had to deceive just like he deceived in heaven. So the world is what? The world is deceived. And they say, well, this is all we know. This is what we've been taught. Absolutely. He's been good at it. He's been at it for many long years. Huh. He's going to speak words against the Most High. Listen. And he shall, these are identifying marks. We'll go over each one in a minute. Time that we have. And he noticed this. He speak words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints... Listen, if you feel like you're a saint today, not that you're so good, but you belong to the family of God. Amen. Right? Okay, you belong to the family of God. I know Jesus. I'm like, this is talking about you. This is talking about me. If you believe that you're part of the family of God, you know Jesus, and you think, I'm, I want to go to heaven, this power is going to think, because we realize the enemy is behind it, He's going to do what? He's going to wear out the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change times and laws. Man, these are such clear, identifying marks of the enemy and his plan. And you know what we do? Most of us just sleep through it. Most of us just take it. It doesn't really matter. You think not? You think not. If you think that's what's going on in the world today is messed up, it's all heading in the direction that we're talking about right now. It's heading in the direction. You talk about communism. You talk about socialism. You talk about the change of this world to where your rights and your freedoms and your constitution, your bill of rights, all gone. You have none. That's right. Fascism. All of these things are headed in that direction to where the government takes care of you, basically gives you little stipends here and there, and you just be a good boy and girl. Is that okay to say that? Look at the history. Look at all that's happened in the past. It's exactly the way it's operated. Yeah. Happened in France during that way, too. You look what happened to them, man. They gave it up. They disbanded God. They disbanded religion. The Bibles burn everything. Killed thousands. Pretty soon after about three years, they came back to their senses. But what a mess. The Bible says, but notice this. This power, then, God would allow it to prosper. Listen. 1,260 years. What can happen in 1,260 years? You and I forget yesterday. Is that true? Think about 1,260 years of... I almost said baloney. Can I say baloney up here? Lies of the devil. Baloney. Terry, I said baloney. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Of lies of the devil stacked on the other, stacked on the other, and this generation dies off, that generation dies, this generation, this generation, this generation, and it comes down to our time. We don't know what truth is. It's been covered, but God said, Isaiah 58, He said He's going to uncover the truths before He shall come. There's going to be a people that will rise up and begin to proclaim a message that has not been proclaimed before because it's been covered with traditions of men and lies of the devil. He wants you to think you're a Christian. He wants you to believe in the cross of Calvary, but he doesn't want it to change you. He said it'd be given to a time and a times and a dividing of times. Most people have no idea. You let the Bible interpret itself. When you talk about a time, people say, I don't know what time, a time. We'll read that in just a moment when we have time to do that. So we're seeing a power that's pointed out here in Scripture. Listen, this this power challenges God. And it should challenge you as God's children. It challenges His people. It challenges His law. Why should I be concerned about it? Why don't I just go on something smooth and talk about what other world wants to hear? Man, we fill this place up. Man, let's get the, let's get the excavator. Let's, 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 get, let's, get, let's just start building on. Let's increase the parking lot. Let's build up two stories. You see what I mean? Just preach those things that people go, mm, I feel good. And we go, oh, I feel good. Right? Give $10 and you'll get 30 back. Everybody comes through the door. I'm not going to preach no little Mickey Mouse $30. I'm going to say 100 fold. I'm going to say 200 fold. Okay. You see what I'm talking about. People just go for that. Instead of saying, we better get it right. We better get it right because time is almost gone. Jesus has made it clear in His Word. If we take Daniel 7, 25, 
which we just read, and examine a few of the points. I believe it will help us understand the whys this power would speak great words, challenge God against the Most High. Against there simply means, that's what it means. Against the Most High means to the side of, of over against. It would be an opposition. So this power then would be an opposition of God. So we're going to identify who this power is as we go along. It, it says, I want to be equal with God. So we'd have to look at a power that's claiming or wanting to be equal with God and working toward that. Hmm. If anyone in the Bible we ever... Oh, 2 Thessalonians, you say. Well, good for you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 in the New Testament, the Bible said, here's a power. Notice what it does. 2 Thessalonians what? 2, verse... Yeah, most of you are going to go out here and you're going to say, oh boy, we're having haystacks for lunch. Oh boy, having haystacks for lunch, man. Somebody put the tomato and the onions on. Listen, we need a little fire underneath our bellies right now, underneath our seats, because again, this is not what God, I'll tell you, God was saying right now, His people will rise up in opposition because it says here, He warns us through His apostle Paul, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, he said, here's a power that's going to rise up that's going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God. Did you get it? The power would do what? Oppose God. Or, now notice this, here's the key, or that is worshipped. So this power then would have to be a power that what? Demands worship. A religious political power. Come on, stay with me. These are identifying marks. Yeah, that's what it says. He opposes and he's exalted. He said in Isaiah 14, I will rise above what? The throne of God. I will sit on the throne of God. Oh. And so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself, notice, that he is God. And then you write a little article and say, well, we really didn't mean that. Well, that's not really what he meant. Well, he just took part of it. He took part of it out of context. Don't kid yourself. The Bible is clear. This bold power, whew, if I can just say it nice as I can, this bold, this power is Satan's right hand man. He's ready to carry on the work that Satan started in heaven, and he's going to continue it. And it's a fight against the law of God. Then, 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 then in heaven, he challenges right God's authority, God's government. He challenges it. It should be different. The world today, in a lot of religious circles, they say, well, it should be different. We don't have to worry about being obedient. We kind of do as we please. Just believe it's going to be all right. Don't you kid yourself. The Bible said the devils believe and tremble, but you know what? That hasn't changed them. Belief is not enough. Praise God for belief. It's not enough. There has to be a change. This power, according to Daniel 7, 25 Notice this. Again, we're, we're going to identify a little bit more. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I said, right oh, boy. He's going to wear out the saints. You know what that simply means? Wear out. The word he's going to kill. He's going to make war with the saints. Whew. And he's going to do it, verse through verse 21 there, through persecution. And you've seen it through the ages. We'll see it more as we come down to the end of time. He would think. He would intend he would endeavor, deliberately try to change the law of God. He would deliberately try to change the law of God. Change times and laws. Huh. Isn't that very interesting? So he would make a deliberate attempt to exercise, notice this, the prerogatives of God. This is the power it's talking about here. Huh. And these changes would help him to direct the course of human history. Well, who could do that? Who could just jump in and say, God, you're out. Now I'm in. Prerogatives of God. Let me just give you one example. There's many. Somebody mentioned at the beginning. Remember it said this power would speak blasphemies against God. You know, a lot of things in Christian we call blasphemy. Oh, that's blasphemy. But really, when you look at Scripture... Uh, study uh, Matthew chapter uh, 9, and you can read verses 3 through 5. Very, very, very interesting. 
because Jesus was having a confrontation. You remember? Something was going on, and he heals someone. And you know, they, oh, they can't do that. Jesus said, thy sins be what? He does the healing, and then he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. Oh, they said, oh, no, you can't. That's blasphemy. Remember? Who can forgive sin but God only? The power that would rise would be a power that would claim to forgive sin on earth. That's what the Bible says. Does that make sense? That's what blasphemy, now I can compare it to a lot of different things, but blasphemy is that earthly power that claims to forgive sin on earth. You have to look around and say, oh, what religion, what, who, who, who claims this? Wow. I say this, it is God who determines the times. It is God who, what, who deserve, you know, determines the time. God sets up kings and he takes them down. Listen, throughout all the New Testament, think quickly with me. Time's really going down. The New Testament times, Christians observe the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. Is that right? Yeah. Acts, take Acts chapter 17. I had a man study with me one time. Very interesting. I love to study the Bible with you. He said, it's okay, good. He said, but we will only study in the book of Acts. Well, was there 66 books? Is that right? So we're going to throw out 65... I said, why the book of Acts? I love that too, but no, it, there's, there's the whole Bible there. No, that's only as my... Well, here in Acts chapter 17, verse 2, it says, And Paul, listen, and Paul, was Paul a prophet of God? Was he God's messenger? Was he called of God to get the message to the Gentiles? Absolutely, a changed man of God. Paul was a Sabbath keeper. Paul was a seventh-day keeper. I'll be real bold, not trying to offend anybody, but he was... <laughs> Oh, he was, he was Seventh-day Adventist. And the reason I say that is, is because when you say Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh-day means you go to church on the seventh day of the week. That's what the Bible says. Adventist means you believe in the second coming. Every church ought to have Advent somewhere in it, every denomination. That just simply means you believe in the second coming. If you don't believe in the second coming, it, you can't be God's people. Okay, you got enough of that, right? Don't hear any more of that. Oh, but just think, this, think, please. as his matter was, he says, he went in to them three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the scripture. Right. We see this power has attempted to do what? It's attempted to do some changing here. I thought it was very, very, very interesting, the changes. It's attempted to change the Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week. Now remember, what did prophecy say? Daniel 7, 25, he shall think to change times and law. This power will try to kill, persecute God's people. Man, if we get all through this, you'll, you'll see as we go. How can you do it 10 minutes? I don't know. But these are identifying marks. No other power in the whole world can match up to what we're going at here. None. It has to be this power. Because this attempted change is almost universal now around the world. But how? Just bear with me. Because we believe that the seven days continues on as the changeless memorial of God's original creation. It started back in the beginning of creation. Plus, it's a sign of His recreative power to recreate us. So taking the Bible and just the Bible only... We are unable, I am unable, maybe you can, I'm unable to find any scripture that would warrant any kind of a change. Therefore, we, you know, follow what we believe. Now, the world is following traditions and commandments of men. Are you still with me? So today, you're either following what the Bible said or the traditions of men. Jesus made it very, very clear in Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. Remember, this is an identifying mark of this devil, this demon, Lucifer, before he fell, came down and said, this is what I'm going to do. And I'll give, here's the identifying marks of what he's trying to do. Jesus was speaking, he said, but he answered and said unto them. Jesus talking about the religious leaders. He said, why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? Can you imagine the king of the universe and look at all the stuff that you're doing 
your traditions then, notice this, you're canceling out. You're transgressing the commandments of God. And then he makes it clear, verse 6. Thus, have you made the commandments of God non-effect by your tradition? It either is a tradition, the change that came about, or it is from, directly from the hand of God. Interesting, Jesus knew about nothing, right, in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Forty years after his death, Jesus said, I pray that your flight be not in the winter, nor on the Sabbath day. The king of the universe didn't know about any kind of change, as it were, because almost 40 years in the future, he was still calling to Seventh-day Sabbath. Huh, what has happened? Boy, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we need to look at as God's people because the devil said, here's the plan. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm, God said, I'm going to list it out in the Word to expose you. But the devil said, I'm not worried about too many people. They're not going to study it anyway. So verse 9 really hits it hard right here. Notice this. It says, but in vain they do what? Worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. What does Jesus say? He said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of what? Of men. So you can claim it all you want. No, I love God. I'm doing it. He said, it's in vain that you worship me, teaching for doctrines or commandments of men. This is what we have to look at. How does the enemy come in? False doctrines. And just, Sabbath begins to, you know, the enemy begins to throw these things out into the church. And people grab onto them and say, oh, this seems like this is what it is. And we grab sometimes things that have no foundation whatsoever. We didn't know it. We were not accountable because we, we didn't know it. But God said in the last days he'll raise a group of people that will proclaim the three angels' message that will warn the world. I wish we had time to get into it. We will not. But James 4, 17, the Bible is very clear. Listen, brothers and sisters, instead of being, oh, oh I wish I had known all this time. I wish I had known. This is only touching the edges of the information. But Jesus said to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him it is sin. Did you get it? Many can say, well, how about mom and how about dad? Oh, oh, if they did not know, they are not accountable. They do you do what you can do. But now God said he's bringing light forward because it's very clear there in 1 John 3, 4. The Bible said, whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is what? Okay, just simply say this. If the law of God is done away with, and that's what you proclaim, then there's no sin. Do what you want. Sin is the transgression of God's law. When we say the law of God is no longer binding, then there's no sin. Does that make sense? No. No. Not to us, we're saying, but that's, that's what it means. For sin is the transgression of the law. But it, Romans 4, 15 says this. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Where there's no law, what? I'm not trying to hoodwink you. I'm not trying to fool you. The Bible is clear here. The law must be in operation. James 2, 10 through 12 talk about every man will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. There has to be a standard in the judgment that's equal for everybody in every part of the world. Sin is a transgression of the law to say, well, no, no, what we won't, no, most of us don't have the nerve to say, well, the law of God's done away with it. We'll say nine of them is. James 2, 10, where you offend in one point, we're guilty of all. You see, the Sabbath at least in my opinion, in my studies, you may have something different, was not a test in the medieval times. Are you still with me? It was not a test even in the 16th century, the Reformation period, um, the time of Wesley, and some of the great reformers. It was not a test at that point in time. But in these last days, it becomes a test. Because God said He'll raise the people to bring attention to all the commandments, all ten None of us would have the, you know, the audacity to say, well, we don't have to worry about that. In fact, he said, all truth is going to be restored before Jesus comes. Isaiah 58, 12, he's a restorer of the past to dwell in. All of this is just simply said to go to, and we're not even going to get even where close to it. But it's saying that this power said, this is what we're going to be doing. And again, it's all laid out, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then what? Many times we just will not accept it because of our pride. We do not accept it because we say, oh, my lens, I was wrong all this time. God, say, well, God would say, praise the Lord. It's all right. You said you wouldn't. Now, what are we going to do? Let's, let's redeem the time. Let's keep going. Amen. We all agree that God knows the future, do we not? Amen. He knows the future, Isaiah 46, 10. 
He says he declares the end from the beginning. Huh. Amos 3, 7, the Bible said he revealeth secrets unto his what? The servants, the prophets. God is going to reveal. Listen, there's no, you think there's 10,000 ways in order to, a way to get to heaven. We better think again. There's only one way, that's through Jesus Christ. How are you saved? Oh, it's not by obeying. It's not by keeping, as it were. It's not by, oh, you live under. By, by, by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God. But there's no use to throw out the part of obedience. Christ was obedient unto death. Praise God for that. If he was not, none of us would make it to the kingdom of God. There's nothing wrong to say obedient. How is it we can say, oh, well, I'm going to play the football game, but I'm not going to go by the rules. Get out. I play basketball. There's some rules. Get out. None of us say that, right? First thing we say when it goes haywire, what's the rules? Right? What are the rules? Well, the rules says... The rules is simply said what God's safety for us is. Thou shall not. Why? Because if you do, Kenny, it'll hurt you. It'll hurt you, and I don't want you to get hurt. I think today it would be very simple if we had take Catholic folk, we'd take the Protestant folks today, all the historians you could gather up that's written so much and studied so hard. They, they follow the, the breakage up of the Roman uh, Empire and the papacy and papal Rome. Why? They will come down to say, you know, when that broke up the Roman Empire, there was ten kingdoms. And people said, well, what are those ten kingdoms? I wish we had time more to talk about them. We examine those, and I think we'll take time to do that next time we come together about the little horn and his plan to hoodwink you, his plan to make sure you're not in the kingdom of God. Until then, I guarantee you the devil will come against you. He will do everything in his power to make sure you say, well, I, tell you, I don't agree with that. You haven't heard enough to maybe agree or disagree at this point. But we have heard plenty enough, right, that we can read to say there is a power that says we are God upon this earth. We claim the prerogatives of God. The enemy said, right, and we read it there in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, that he said when he came down here, that he's going to sit in the throne room of God. He's going to be as God on earth, and this is what he's going to do. And one of them, he claims to forgive sin. Man, we need to fit this thing together because he's persecuting, he's going to kill God's people and get rid of them. He has a plan. When he comes up, he would uproot three. Do you remember that? Yeah, of the ten. We need to know this power beyond a shadow of a doubt, and we need to put forth a fight because we have a message to give called the three angels' message to give to the world. I want to be a part of that, don't you? Because it's God's plan. No one said it would be easy. It's going to be a test. It's going to be a trial. It'll be a decision I know that you want to make. Let me just have a short prayer for you right now and pray for me as we close. Shall we pray together? Loving Father in heaven, again, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you're warning us that you're soon to come in the clouds of glory. Oh, Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to swallow anything that we need to swallow. Simply put our eyes upon you. We may be ready for your coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us here at Behold the Lamb. We look forward to spending time with you next time. Hello and welcome back. Time is of the essence. We must wake up and tell others what God has left in his word for us to give us all hope and direction. So often, I've thought about what the last days on this earth would be like. I've wondered how I would, how I could personally survive during the time of trouble that the Bible predicts right before the coming of our Lord. And like many others, I realize, I realize it's very possible that the Lord may see fit that I sleep in the grave before his return. I'm sure that many of you Christians, many of you like believers have had these same thoughts and these same questions. However, as I was pondering one day before we were preparing for this message, the thought came vividly to my mind that I was born here, that we're all here for such a time as this. And it gave me hope because I thought if we're here, God put us here right now, therefore He can strengthen us. He can enable us to face whatever it is as long as we are 100% hid in Christ. That reminder gave me such hope and a renewed sense of purpose as I hope it will you as well. 
as we realize that this beast power that Pastor Kenny just spoke about today will continue to exercise power over the inhabitants of the world before Christ's return. This power has joined hands across the gulf with what she calls her daughters. And like many of our own children, her daughters will be working with her as her image to pass laws that will sorely try the true children of God. This final war is before us. We are no doubt beginning to see how the whole world can, has, and will come together, just as foretold in biblical prophe prophecy, to bring the final events to a worldwide crescendo, as it were. We are witnessing this coming together under global initiatives such as the pandemic, climate crisis, and the teetering economic collapse. Today's message again, Pope Leo XIII, we hold upon the earth the place of God Almighty with Pastor Kenny Shelton. This is a message that we want to make available to you as always, for a love gift of just $8 or more, please don't forget that or more. I know time is getting tough financially and it's getting tough financially here, but we can only bring these messages to you as we have your support. We're just a supporting ministry. We are also wanting to offer once again, a free book, which is entitled The Mark of the Beast. The Mark of the Beast, you should see that on your screen. What a blessing that we have access to so many messages that will enable us to learn so much information very, very quickly. So to get your copy of today's message or your free book or both, simply contact us here in the United States at 618-942-5044, that's Central Time to donate or to order either the book or the DVD, again entitled, Pope Leo XIII, We Hold Upon the Earth, the Place of God Almighty. You may also mail in your request to Behold the Lamb Ministries, P.O. Box 2030, Heron, Illinois, 62948. You may also email us at contact at beholdthelambministries.com or visit us on our website at BeholdTheLambMinistries.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and become our friend on Facebook. Until next time, friends, may our precious Lord continue to richly bless you and yours.